Okay, we'll call the third uh, committee of the whole meeting to order. Everyone, please stand. To the Pledge of Allegiance first. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Did you, you didn't get anything? Did he say anything about roll call? I'm just going to get the information for roll call. Uh, we, uh, Chairperson, uh, President of the Council, uh, Mr. Bourne is not here, and also Jim Gisha, the uh, Vice President, are not here. So Eric Rinfleisch is going to be the Secretary for this uh, meeting, and he'll call roll. Okay. Bourne excused. Bauck is excused. Bowers excused. Decker? Gisha is excused. Hannah is excused. Heidemann? Here. Kath? Here. Kittleson? Here. Clyunis? Here. Montemayor? Here. Renfleisch is here. Surik? Here. Vanderweel? Here. Vu? Here. And Wagaman? Here. 11 present. 11 present. We have quorum. Thank you. Uh, we would like to entertain and approve all the minutes from June 30th Committee of the Whole meeting. So moved. So moved. We moved and seconded to approve the minutes from June 30th. Any discussion on the minutes? Okay. Okay. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. They stand approved. Thank you very much. Uh, the agenda this evening is just one item, so we want to get right at it. And uh, Steve Sokolowski from City Planning and Development will introduce our speakers and our pres presenters today. I believe we all have a plan outline for us so we can follow along with that and um, ask questions as we want. Would you, I don't know, just go ahead and introduce. Thank you. And this is the mic. Which one is it? This one right here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Council. Nice to see you guys this evening. And again, we're talking about the Taylor Drive District Master Plan. Um, in August of 2008, we were here with the preferred alternative. Um, prior to having the document formally adopted by the Common Council, uh, the discussion was that we should at least have an opportunity to one last time publicly speak and have it presented before the Committee of the Whole and the public uh, based on Channel 8. So um, Jeff Sanders is here of Omni and Associates, as well as Clark Meyer. I'm not going to take any of just thunder. I can help answer questions if anyone has any. But I did want to thank uh, several people with regards to this process. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank um, uh, Planning and Development Director Paul Ed Enders and, and uh, Chad Pelashek from the Planning and Development Office. A lot of time and energy spent on our office on this plan. I want to thank Jeff Sanders and his staff at Omni and Associates. Um, they really were instrumental in the development of this plan, um, really took the lead in uh, having several public meetings in terms of uh, uh, pr providing information to the public to, in order to get a, a base of information in terms of finding out from the city of Sheboygan what we really wanted to see the Taylor Drive master plan look like with many of their uh, exercises with the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, threats, visual preferences, cognitive mapping, many different things that they had presented that they used to, uh, in essence, compile the data and now use their expertise to help us out in uh, providing some uh, alternatives and some ways of potentially developing the Taylor Drive corridor in the future. Wanted to thank um, the t uh, Mayor Ryan and today's present council, as well as Mayor Perez and the previous council, with the fact of recognizing that this is an important corridor, that we needed to do some things, we need to do some planning and to take on an effort like this because Taylor Drive is a, in, a very important corridor and something needs to be done, not only to help those businesses that are doing well now, but to also make it a thriving corridor once again. So that's, uh, I appreciate uh, the council's uh, uh, help in that matter. Also I wanted to thank the members of the uh, Sheboygan Development Corporation. Uh, John Rohde and Gary Dulmas were attended several meetings, so I appreciate that. 
and last but not certainly not least, all the stakeholders that participated in these meetings, the property owners, the business owners, the people, the, the citizens that took their time to participate. You can't have a good plan without citizen participation and getting the input from everyone in the community. So I think that's real important. And because of that, I think we'll have a, a better plan because of that. So again, what we're doing here today is we basically were uh, developing a plan for the long-term viability of the Taylor Drive uh, corridor, and we're looking to basically have the plan implemented. We're looking for the Committee of the Whole to recommend favorably to the Common Council to eventually adopt this long-term strategy, land use strategy, for the uh, viability of Taylor Drive in the future. So with that, I will introduce Jeff Sanders of Omni and Associates. We lost our phone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Thanks. I promised I would not say Mayor Bob, even though you asked, so it's Mr. Mayor. As Steve pointed, can, first of all, can everybody hear me okay with it there? As Steve pointed out, we've been at this for a while now. Um, as he also pointed out, there was an election in between when we started and where we are tonight. So some of the people in this room may have more experience or more knowledge of this process than others. And in recognition of that, what I wanted to do is just briefly go over where we started, how we got to where we are tonight. The majority of the time that Clark and I will be talking tonight, and certainly the majority of the time that um, we'll be fielding question and answers if there are any focuses on the chapter that you have in front of you right now It's called chapter 8. It's the preferred development alternative It's essentially the decision that this community has made thus far There were other alternatives that were considered actually quite a few alternatives that were considered There were three that were presented. We'll talk briefly about those um, But then we'll get into the guts of the reason for tonight's meeting That's chapter 8 by all means if you have any questions at any time, please ask um, raise your hand toss something in my direction whatever it takes um, we had a nine phase planning process. Essentially there are nine chapters to this planning document uh, listed above. Um, each one of those is essentially, forgive the metaphor, but a brick that we use to construct the foundation for this plan. Um, some of it is, as Steve alluded to earlier, public participation oriented. As a, as a planner for the past six, 16 and a half years, um, I know that regardless of whether you're looking at a citywide plan or a neighborhood plan or even working on a, a structure, an individual, individual structure as Clark works on as an architect, uh, public participation is the key component. It's the most important thing. Elected official support is fantastic. Um, getting private developers and others involved is, is fantastic. But you have to have public participation. You have to have that ground level buy-in for the project. Or it's a document that tends to sit on a bookshelf and collect dust. And planners like me, architects like Clark, city staff hate seeing plans that sit on shelves and gather dust. Um, the introduction chapter uh, basically just describes the community in general, describes the district in particular. There's a map, a summary of the plan structure and meetings, a guide to each of the chapters, and then finally a discussion or a reference to how the plan will be implemented when we get to the implementation chapter. Uh, the project area was defined in the, in the request for proposals. Um, it has been expanded slightly since the original definition. Um, it doesn't appear on this map, but there's a triangular area here that appears that exists north of Mo Kohler Memorial Drive that has been included within the project area or the study area. Um, it includes the, the big um, commercial nodes that we have within the district. Uh, certainly Memorial Mall, Taylor Heights Shopping Center, um, the former Walmart site, and a number of other properties. And it also includes the Sugar property, the very large undeveloped farm southwest of the corridor. Chapter 2 focused on existing conditions, and it is as it implies, just a description of the existing conditions in terms of land uses, structures, um, available businesses, vacancies, that sort of thing within the district. Transportation assessment focused on the existing transportation network, its capacity, and its limitations, not only for today, but for the limitations that may come into play as you go forward with implementation of the project. An infrastructure assessment looks at all the infrastructure, water, utilities, cable, that sort of thing. Um, is the capacity there to address current needs? The answer to that question was yes. The question then becomes, is there sufficient capacity to address whatever the plan would call for? 
And when we did this part of the phase way back in the beginning, we weren't sure what you, where you as a community wanted to go within the district. What we were sure of is that you had existing infrastructure to support almost anything that was proposed short of heavy industry, and I suspect that was never a real option within the district. Um, there are some upgrades that would be necessary. Certainly, if uh, development occurs on the sugar property, you're going to have to have infrastructure serving that, that part of the district. In terms of market considerations, what we did is identified five communities that share traits similar to the city of Sheboygan. They're not the same in terms of population. They're not the same in terms of geographic footprint. But in terms of the issues related to the district, uh, the Taylor Drive district, there are many similarities between these five. You'll see them as the village of Ashwabanon, the cities of Fond du Lac, Janesville, Manitowoc, and Port Washington. The one thing that all six communities have in common is they're all located on water. And water plays a key role, has played a key role in the history of the community, and certainly will play one of the key roles in the future of the community. And we did additional market area data analysis and future market analyses as well. As Steve mentioned, there were a variety of meetings that we held early in the process for the public um, to encourage participation, a kickoff meeting, a vision meeting. And we also conducted stakeholder interviews. Uh, city staff identified a number of key stakeholders within the district, primarily business owners and landowners whose participation they felt was critical to the long-term success of the project. We sat, I sat down with them and interviewed them, most, most cases about an hour to an hour and a half of their time um, with about 25 questions, if I remember correctly, um, all about how they felt about the corridor today, where, what visions they had for the future corridor, <clears throat> and what role they saw um, themselves playing in partnership with the city and other, other entities, other stakeholders in going forward. Chapter seven, we presented a series of design and development alternatives, and I'll talk about those um, briefly in a moment. But in the introduction to the section, we wanted to talk about signage and wayfinding. You know, basically, how do we get the, the um, market to the market? How do we get um, consumers, residents, um, future business owners, um, Industri light industry or light manufacturing if desired, how do you get them from wherever they are to here? And once within the district, how do those people navigate their way through the district? Um, and wayfinding is different than just signage. I mean, way there's a, a, a technique to wayfinding that makes for easy and conducive travel within a corridor. It's not just signage, it's landscaping, it's thematic use of pedestrian amenities and bicycle amenities, signage desi designs. Um, <clears throat> And the wayfinding features, one of which one of our other architects drew up um, as an entry feature, a gateway feature to the district. We want to differentiate the Taylor Drive district from the remainder of the city of Sheboygan. It's a unique, different district. It's not downtown. It's not South Pier, Riverfront, or Lakefront. So we want to play on its strengths, not compare it to the other districts within the community. Um, all three of the proposals that we presented included a mixed-use component focused on the Taylor Heights Shopping Center Walmart property. Uh, mixed-use being a mixture of uses within the same structure, on the same site, or on adjoining sites. Those uses typically are commercial, office, and residential. So it's conceivable in the future that we'll see two, three, four, five-story buildings uh, within the district wherein the first floor is devoted to commercial uses, the second floor may be office uses, a real estate office, or something of that ilk. And, this, and the floors above would be residential living. Everything from potentially condominiums to rental apartments, one, two, three, of any size. Um, and the key, the, the reason for that is the key to the long-term future success of this district is going to be having people in it 24-7. And one of the things we talked about quite a bit throughout this process was our the, the impossibility of turning back the clock. Um, what the Taylor Drive corridor once was, a thriving commercial district, in that format, it's unlikely to ever be again. What it can be is an equally or more thriving commercial district based upon a differing set of design uses, a differing set of land uses. Um, big box retail is probably not going to be the dominant player within the district that it was in the past. And the reason for that has little to do with the desires of the city or the existing landowners and everything to do with market priorities. Um, big box retail tends to gravitate towards highway corridors now and major through corridors. And you've seen that, you've experienced that firsthand. That's part of the reason, a significant part of the reason um, why you began this project. The other thing is we wanna look at 
land uses that are economic generators, land uses that catalyze the kind of growth or the kind of development that you want to see here. So mixed use development brings a 24-7 audience into the, mar into the district. And that audience becomes a market for the kinds of development that will occur as a result. So the first one we set, suggested was the event park with a conference center. Because the Sugar property is such a beautiful site, what we wanted to do, what the city asked us to do, both staff and official and um, stakeholders, was to identify varying densities or varying differences of development for the parcel. We wanted a relatively low density option, kind of a middle density option, and perhaps a more dense option. But all three of the options that we brought for discussion and all the options that we considered were based on the protection of that corridor protection of existing wooded areas, protection of the wetlands, the floodplains, and more, most importantly, perhaps, protection of Willow Creek. It's an incredibly significant resource that you have right in the middle of the western part of the city, right on the periphery of the western part of the city. And if, it, if it's developed over time, we want to make sure that that development is done in harmony with that landscape. Because that landscape, in effect, is going to be the selling point or one of the key drivers of whatever happens within this district. And I can't stress that enough. The Sugar property as part of this project is the key determinant of the long-term future of the Taylor Drive district. And we'll talk, I'm sure, quite a bit more about that in the near future. Um, so the, actually, Clark, if you'd like to talk a little bit about the event park and hotel and conference center and the other two alternatives. What we looked at at this particular option is developing this area as a park-like setting and creating areas along the outside edge for hospitality, mixed-use development, and then reuse, uh, adaptive reuse of the existing mall. And this was one of the three options we looked at. The second one was to take this same area and create a research park in which we bring in as many as 2,000 people to work down in the, on that Shuker property. And what's the one thing that those 2,000 people need? They need all of the amenities from day to day, restaurants, um, dry cleaners, uh, video stores, and so forth, which could all be developed in this mixed use area. The third option was to take it uh, one step farther and make this, uh, uh, designate this as a senior living center, which would provide people 24 hours of living in, this, in the same district that they shop, that they work, and all of that could take place. The senior housing could be down here with retail development along the periphery. So the last time we were here, um, those are the alternatives we presented. Then you as a community through city staff came back to us and said, this is the one we want to go forward with. And that one, the preferred development alternative is what we'll spend the remainder of the evening talking about. It's the research park, research park with the mixed use office, <coughs> excuse me, mixed use retail scheme. So again, the key features to this are the gateway features. Th those elements of the project, or those elements of the plan that differentiate the Taylor Drive District from other districts within the community, from other places nearby. Um, and those would be forms of monument signage and other types of signage at the entrance, at the ingress and egress points of the district, but equally importantly, um, thematically similar elements throughout the district. So if you decide in, in the future, if you decide to go with a, a natural rock monument gateway feature, you'd want to use that, that design theme in all of the signage and all the wayfinding components within the district itself. If you go with wood or any other design feature, you'd want to do that. We're looking to maintain, to create and maintain a theme throughout the district so that people know when they're in the district that they're in the district. Um, a key component of this is going to be redevelopment at Memorial Mall. Um, all of the development that occurs is, and we'll talk again a, a little bit more about this in a moment, but all the development that occurs is going to be development that's initiated or, or, or undertaken by private, develop, private developers, private interests. But the city's gonna play a significant role in guiding that development. There's a variety of ways it can do so through funding strategies um, and other things. Um, but it's important to recognize that uh, the mall in its existing state has some, a couple tremendous assets. I mean, certainly Kohl's is something that's doing well. Shopko is doing well. But there are some challenges there as well. There are challenges in malls across the country. And what we're seeing is many of the old traditional malls built in the late 60s, early 70s are converting to community and civic centers, which are wonderful gathering places, but not great generators of tax income. Um, or they're being raised for housing. 
Housing is also nice, but again, housing doesn't create jobs. Jobs are important, that sort. Of. So what we want to do is look at Memorial Mall and say, what can be done with the existing structure, preserving its strengths, enhancing its, enhancing its weaknesses. So that was a focus. Um, obviously, the Taylor Heights property and the, and the Walmart site, um, you know, the Walmart site is a, a vacant structure that is sitting there waiting for somebody to come up with a really good idea of what to do with it. That was part of what this planning process was about. And then finally, the research park, the campus setting at the Sugar property. Um, the gateway features at entry points, wayfinding throughout the district, uh, decorative lighting and pedestrian bicycle amenities. One of the things we heard throughout this process, we want more bicycle trails, we want more places to walk, we want alternative modes of transportation from the car. Now, clearly, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the automobile is still going to be the dominant form of transportation. Whether it's hybrid, electric, hydrogen cell or some other high-tech form of transportation, it's, it's or, um, power, it's still going to be the car. But we want to enhance opportunities for people to get around without having to get into the car. And again, that's to get through the district, to the district, and from the district. Clark? We looked at different types of, of <coughs> mixed use. One would be creating townhomes along the, the edge to get people the opportunity to show ownership of a particular structure. The other is to incorporate mixed use buildings inside the, uh, the Taylor Heights area, which would have retail and office on the lower levels, and then living units above. And these are just some examples of different styles of residential living. We're looking at townhomes along the outer edge, which uh, uh, abut the adjacent residential areas to the, well, especially to the east, but also this uh, area to the north and then going with a larger structure pulling that out toward the street to create and define an area that could that the residents could then take ownership of with fountain features uh, and create this this element in which they have their own neighborhood within the district as well <coughs> one of the big stumbling points on this is what to do with the, the, the existing uh, mall and one item or one possibility is to bring in a major retailer that would create the district as a destination um, whether that's a this we just have an example of a Cabela's or a Bass Pro Shop something of that nature in which members of this community as well as people in Northeast Wisconsin would travel to Sheboygan to be able to use these type of facilities once they're in the district we also provide hotel accommodation so that they have the opportunity to not only come to the district, experience what's going on on Taylor Drive, but also stay there. Once they're staying there, then they're going to need all the other amenities as well. And that would be, you know, getting a hotel possibly out here right at Colin Memorial Drive. This is what Jeff was talking about in, on that uh, gateway feature that maybe it's some kind of a water element or something with signage to identify that you're entering into the Taylor District. And then eliminate some of that asphalt parking that's out there and create more of a park-like setting with the introduction of more landscaping both along Taylor Drive and also within the, uh, the mall parking lot, the existing mall parking lot that it's where it stands today. And finally, the development of the Shuker property into a research park. Getting high-tech industry down in that particular area, whether it's medical research or technology, would create the people that would then use the, the other amenities that would occur along the Taylor Drive corridor. Um, this can be done with whether it's a competition, uh, a national competition to attract well-known architects to, de to design green buildings, for example, which would then entail people would, would maybe want to come and see what those green buildings are, so that now you're introducing more people to, that, to the district as well. And one of the strengths of the Sugar property, one of the strengths of the Taylor Drive District is the Sugar property in the sense that almost every community that you're going to be competing against, because every community out there is going to be trying to secure some of the same types of businesses, some of the same types of industry and commercial development that you're going to pursue. There are very, very few in this area, basically Milwaukee up to Green Bay and points west, that have something like the Sugar property there that have this beautiful natural setting that essentially looks like a bowl, right? When you're in the middle of the sugar property and you look around, you don't see the city of Sheboygan. You see trees, 
wetlands, you see the stream, there's a ridge that kind of comes all the way around from the, the far northwest corner all the way down to the far southeast corner. That's an opportunity. The kinds of development, particularly the, the green economy, sustainable development, sustainable jobs that every community in the country is trying to get right now. We'll look at a place like that much different than they'll look at many of the communities that you're going to be competing with and competing against. So we want, again, we want to use the natural assets that exist within the district as an attraction for the kinds of development that we're looking at, that you're looking for. And this gets into the campus plan where we maintain as much of the green spaces as we can and yet intermingle buildings, minimal parking, with a lot of landscaping to create this park-like setting on that lower Schuchert property to again maintain the, the green theme throughout. What we did on this map, the coloring that you see in the kind of burnt red are areas that we identified as undevelopable. They're areas that either are wetland or floodplain or are within close proximity to wetland or floodplain. Those would be permanently preserved potentially through conservation easements and a variety of other tools that the city could use. Um, they'd be available as park and recreational assets, potentially locations for bicycle trails and pedestrian trails within the corridor. Um, but what we're left with is essentially what Clark described, a very campus-like setting. We have individual nodes of development that exist so that, you know, if we're lucky, we have one big University of Wisconsin or something of the like that comes in and looks at the entire site. What's more likely is you're going to build it up over time. You have a couple that will look close to the road because their business benefits from that. You may have others that would prefer to be more secluded on the site in that campus setting. Uh, the trails that provide access throughout would have rest and reflection areas, which for planners is a synonym for a place to sit down and eat lunch or you know, watch the birds fly by. Uh, that would be integrated within the site and again connected to the tail drive district as a whole. So it's really about embracing the assets within the corridor. And those assets are significant. Shopco, Kohl's, the other businesses that are doing well within the corridor, and then building upon them with some of the businesses that might find uh, or might be able to enhance the district to be what, you've wanted, what you want it to be. Um, the question about implementation has come up. And what we did in our implementation chapter and what you'll see when we present the plan um, to the city is listed all the tools that are available for local governments to implement plans like this. The city will have opportunities for proactive participation, opportunities to grease the skids, if you will, and it'll be up to you as a community to decide what level of action you take to ensure or to effectuate this plan over time. And really what we were striving for is to create a starting point or a framework from which the kinds of development that you as a city want, the kinds of development that this corridor needs to become the vibrant corridor that it once was, again, um, and we hope that the plan that we put together on the strength of all the information that the city provided, uh, 25, 30, 35 percent of this is us. All the rest of it's you and all the people who participated and said these are our needs, this is what we want to see. Um, and we built upon that to essentially create this plan. And as Clark and those of you who've been in the meetings that I've facilitated know I could keep talking and talking, but I'd prefer to leave the rest to you if you'd like. And I'd entertain any questions that you might have about the process in general, the specific proposals, or Brett Favre playing for the Vikings. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. All the person wants me on. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's a good idea for us to have a master plan to go ahead. We've had the master plan for the South Pier and the development up the river and some of the renovation of neighborhoods. Even though we can't do it right now, we need to have the master plan for the future rather than just let things happen. Yeah, it's an excellent point. I mean, it's certainly one of the questions that has popped up in the past in the recent past, and I'm sure one of the questions some of you are thinking is, well, considering the current economy and the current housing market, how do we do this? That's a good question. Um, I've talked with uh, planners around the state and around the country because that's what planners do. We just sit down and talk about this kind of stuff. Trying to dress up the current economic situation and make it look like a good thing is impossible. It's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. People are losing jobs. Businesses are being hurt. Cities are being hurt, et cetera. 
But if you had to find a bright spot in it, and this is a bit of a stretch, but if you had to find a bright spot, it provides local governments an opportunity to take a time out, to actually sit back and plan for what inevitably will come. And that coming inevitability is a housing market that's gonna be strong again, an economy that's gonna be strong. Now whether that happens in six months, 18 months, or slightly longer, it will happen. Um, I think the economic indicators that we've all seen in the last two or three days are demonstrating that if we haven't bottomed out yet, at least we've made that curve. Um, I think there are a lot of indicators out there, and I'm not an economist, but one of the things planners do is follow this, this kind of stuff very closely. It looks like we've turned a corner, and now the question becomes how long is it going to take to get back to where we were? Well, that's a good question. But this, this economic situation has provided communities like Sheboygan with an opportunity to actually step back, put plans in place, so when that rebound occurs, you're ready for it. Um, and that's all a plan is, right? It's a guidance document. It's not a blueprint. There's a difference between a comprehensive plan and a general plan and a district plan and things like the blueprint for a structure or an ordinance. It provides guidance to the types of act activities and development that this city wants to see within that area. So it was an excellent comment. Thank you. Alderperson Kittleson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, also, uh, Jeff, address the, the fact that, I mean, you were talking, the fact that we have that Shukert property. You're saying to us that's sort of really like a hidden jewel, isn't it? I mean, something that maybe as with development in the future that might give us, you know, give, give us the edge on, uh, that we might need with, with that property being there? Right. Um, it, excellent question. And the, the, the subject of the sugar property has popped up quite frequently through this process for obvious reasons. It doesn't exist within the boundaries of the city of Sheboygan. Why is the city of Sheboygan planning for property that is not within the boundaries? Well, because every, every city does that. Every city envisions growth outward as well as upward. Um, that property is an opportunity that this district and this city has, as I mentioned earlier, that most don't. Now, the question arose about 11 months ago when I was here, you know, what would happen if the sugar property was taken out of play? Well, we could still, and, and I think we have, when I say we, I'm not referring to Omni, the collective we. I think we've put together a plan focused on mixed-use development at Taylor Heights and Walmart that can provide the kind of dynamic that the Taylor Drive District needs to rebound, to recover from what, what it has experienced over the course of the last 10, 15 years or so. Putting the sugar property in play, however, that opens up doors that just wouldn't exist. Um, what, regardless of which one of the alternatives you had chosen, I might add, all of those alternatives had strengths and weaknesses. Um, but all of them would have provided the kind of influx of new um, consumers, consumers of product, consumers of goods, that this district needs to thrive. So yes, um, I believe at the last meeting I made a statement to the effect of, had you written the RFP not including sugar, I don't know that we would have proposed on it because it's so clearly the critical element to this proposal, to this project, to the long-term success. Eventually that property will transition to the city. Now, I also mentioned at that meeting in August last year that if it never did, hypothetically, if it stayed in the town, development is still going to occur there. There's, there's just, short of um, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or somebody buying it and preserving it as it is, the market is going to look at that piece of property and say, we can do something with this, that, that nebulous market that's out there. If it occurred within the town, if stayed within the town's boundaries, the city would still reap tremendous benefit from it because those people aren't going to walk out into the woods at lunch. They're going to walk up onto the tail drive district and and have Thai food or eat at the Chinese restaurant or do it, you know, whatever they do. Um, but it is because of the advantages that cities can provide in terms of utilities, it's, a, it's almost a foregone conclusion that at some point in the future that property is within your boundaries. Any other questions? I have, I have a question, um, Jeff. Yes, um, okay, let's say we take this plan and we say yes, we support it. Um, it could sit there five, ten years. Um, does it have a maintenance 
to it? Do, are there things we need to do to something like this? How long? A, what is the shelf life of something like this? You know, like you're telling us things, you know, let's say five years from now, could we have to do this all over again? I mean. Um, Excellent question. Uh, essentially, a, a, a master plan like this is a catalyzer. And just like any other catalyzer, it requires fuel, it requires oxygen, et cetera. Well, the fuel, the oxygen, if you will, that the city can provide is actually quite varied. Everything from programs probably many of you, many of you are familiar with, like TIF programs and things like that, um, infrastructure improvements, enhancements, um, tax incentives, and other things, to incentivize the kind of development that you want to see within the district. But in the end, it's going to require someone, a developer, a business, to say that looks like where we want to be. The city can lay that framework out, can use this plan as, as the, again, the incentivizer of that development, but mm -hmm. in the end, mm -hmm. the market will decide what occurs here. Now, that said, what we did is produced a plan that is market-based. There was nothing of the alternatives that we proposed, the three that came before you about a year ago, and the four or five or so that we, could, that we strongly considered before deciding not to pursue are all market-based. There's a strong market for those types of development, not just in the city of Sheboygan, but in this area in general. And it's the kind of development, again, everybody's going to be competing for. One of the most important things city staff included in the RFP was the term sustainable development. Now, two years ago, I don't know if my mom and dad had ever really heard that term. They know it now. They've heard about the green economy. They've heard about peak oil. They've, heard, they've seen rising energy costs. And although we're in a bit of a lull right now, um, that's not going to last either. Um, there are communities across the country, those that are successful right now, that are weathering this economy better than others, are those that were prepared for this kind of downturn. Util utilizing green development and innovative infrastructure and stormwater, impervious pavement and natural landscaping, the kinds of things that are throughout this plan, the kinds of things that you as a community ask for, not just in the RFP, but throughout the planning process. So there is, there are many things that the city can do to incentivize this, to, to again, grease those skids. Yeah. Um, but we'll find out five years from now if the market, if we were right in our assessment of the market. Going back to your specific question, how long will a plan like this last? Well, 10 years from now, it's out of date. But 10 years from now, hopefully, the plan's no longer necessary. Alderman Wangaman had a question. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I guess we all agree that the city needs economic development, needs economic growth. To what extent has this whole plan been presented to the people who own businesses there now? Uh, say, for instance, the corporation or the company that owns Taylor Heights Shopping Center, uh, the mall, uh, Shopco, these places. Uh, has this all been laid out for them and what is their reaction to it? Excellent question. Um, at the very beginning of this process, we sent out, sent out postcards to every single landowner within the district. So every business owner, every property owner. We also sent them, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, to the residential district, the residential neighborhood to the east. Um, I don't recall what the number was, but it was in the hundreds, I believe. As far as total? Total. I'd say close to 200. Okay, so around 200 notices went out. So every, everyone who owned property or owned a business or had an interest in a business within the district at that time, at the very beginning of this process, received a postcard. And many of those people showed up at the initial meeting. There was a second postcard invitation that went out for the second meeting. Um, the stakeholder interviews that we discussed earlier focused on, again, eight key stakeholders that the city identified, one of which were the owners of the Taylor Heights, uh, Taylor Heights Shopping Center. Um, unfortunately, of the eight that, that we sought for interviews, the owners of the Taylor Heights Center were the only ones that we could not secure for an interview. Um, and I believe there was a lot of transition going on within the company that owns that business. Um, I had calls to New Jersey, New York, and Minnesota, all trying to track down who the appropriate person would be to, we were prepared to drive there, to fly there, or to just do the interview over the phone. That was the only one that we were not able to get a hold of. We did, however, talk to a number of businesses within the Taylor Heights Shopping Center. Um, we talked to the mall. Um, we talked to a couple other realty or land development interests within the district. 
um, another small business, and then uh, the owner of the sugar property, Mr. Sugar. So it's, in one sense, and I hope this doesn't sound flippant, but it's kind of you can lead the horse to water situation. Um, I think the effort that this, that city staff took in trying to secure input from that particular organization um, was significant. And in the end, we just didn't get, we probably didn't get the level of participation that we would have preferred. I also understand that certain areas of the Shuker property uh, could be considered historic uh, Indian lands that would uh, contain significant uh, remnants of Indian culture. Well, one of the things that we did, and it's in the existing conditions assessment, is we looked at a natural and cultural resource assessment throughout the district. Um, there are a number of inventories available. There's the AHI, the Archaeological Historical Inventory, or Architectural and Historical Inventory. Um, there are a number of agencies, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, State Historic Preservation o Office, DNR, and others, who have information related to significant resources in the state. So what we do basically at the beginning of the process is contact them, say this is the property in question, this is the location, what do you know, what do you suspect? Well, the results were a bit surprising to us. Um, not in terms of the possibility that something were there, but the level of something that might be there. Anytime you have two streams, uh, two water bodies that come together, in close proximity to Lake Michigan or Lake Winnebago or another large water body, in this case Sheboygan River and Willow Creek. Um, anytime you have a sheltered cove or, or a sheltered bowl somewhere we have ridge and tree line, those are the kinds of places that would have been permanent encampments um, in some cases, but very, very frequently seasonal um, or temporary encampments. So when we got that information back, we did find a lot of information re um, directly related to campsites, to potential hunting areas like that. Um, now, as you might suspect, uh, the organizations and the agencies that have that information don't really like to give out a whole lot of detail as to what was there and where specifically it was, um, because that can lead to things not being where they were. Um, but what we did learn is there are a number of sites, primarily within Sugar Property and a couple others just south of Sugar Property, that have some significance. So if development occurs, when development occurs, um, as a part of the development process, as part of the construction process, those, those artifacts, if discovered, would have to be protected. And there's a variety of mechanisms to do that. There's something called NAGPRA, it's a Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. There's something called ARPA, the Archaeological Resource Protection Act, and a number of other things that make sure that if you put a shovel in the ground and you find something interesting, you don't put the shovel in the ground again until you address it. But uh, excellent question. There are some, there is evidence that there is some interesting stuff down there. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions, uh, public questions? Okay, we've got some, Paulette Anders from Planning Development as a statement. I just wanted to you want to come up here, please, Paulette? Thank you. Thank you. We were able to contact the owners of um, the Taylor Heights Shopping District. It was after the stakeholder interviews were held and Omni had tried to contact them. So it was months later, but we were finally able to make a connection with them. So we did receive their input. Good. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, Ed Wachowski, would you like to say something? You want to come up? Yeah, question? Citizen input here. I like your proposal, and I like a couple of things that you said. One was a theme over a period of time. And if it's gone over a period of time, what is unique about your plan that puts Sheboygan head and shoulders over another community so it can't be easily duplicated in that community, an example is we have Blue Harbor. Yep. Well, as soon as we built that, Green Bay came along and built a water park. Water parks are easy right. to, to build. What in your plan will make it unique in such a way that people will want to come and not compete with Sheboygan? Right. It's an excellent question. And I wish it, it would be great if there were just like one simple answer. I could say, well, this is what you have. You have a variety of assets that other communities don't. I mentioned the Sugar property, but you also have the Sheboygan River, and you have the lakefront. 
You have that amazing downtown that has undergone so much change in the last uh, decade. You have the riverfront and the lakefront. On top of that, you have your location within the state of Wisconsin. You are ideally suited, be, or ideally situated geographically between Milwaukee, the Fox Cities, Green Bay, and Door County. Um, you also have a, a, a significant amount of existing assets within the district. You have a pretty significant healthcare and medical um, presence. You have incredibly strong school districts. You have a level of quality of life or a quality of life, um, the quality of life indicators that surpass most communities in the Midwest, as I believe Money Magazine or was it Money, Steve? I believe Money Magazine recognized. Um, the level of education, uh, the level of income, the um, general demographic. The city of Sheboygan has an interesting balance of, demo of, of demographic groups from an age standpoint. Most communities are trending very, very, very rapidly towards an older population. Um, the city of Sheboygan actually has a relatively even dispersal of the various age groups. Um, planners and demographers know that the fastest growing demographic group in the country is 80 and over, octogenarians. Um, we also know that the baby boom generation, which has been the most significant player in the development of this country over the last 45 years, um, is going to play a, an equally significant role as it goes through retirement. One of the things we talked about very early in this process is the, the, the state of American cities and villages and towns today to a great degree exists specifically because of that generation from 1946 until 1964. The number of schools that we have, the number of parks that we have, suburbs, the road network, those aren't decisions that somebody made because they were good or bad or they made sense from a planning. Those are, those are all a direct result of the baby boom generation. Well, now that generation is entering retirement age, so it's going to place a different kind of, um, it, it, the role that that generation plays in the local level is going to be significant, but in a much different way. So when we see a, a place like the city of Sheboygan, we look at the fact that you have the natural resources that you have, that you're close proximity to Milwaukee, you're close to the Fox Cities. Those are the kinds of things that are attractive to young families, to educated, um, the educated creative class as a gentleman named Richard, Richard Florida would um, describe, and to retirees and, um, and empty nesters. Most of the communities that will be competing with you and against you don't have all of those assets. Some of them have a few, but very, very few in the state of Wisconsin has, have everything that Sheboygan has. Now, we've had this discussion ongoing throughout this process. What you just heard me say is not something that you'd hear me say when I'm working with the village of Ashwabanon, for instance, which is another one of my clients. They have assets that you don't possess, and it's a big stadium, it's called Green Bay, or it's called Lambeau Field, and they have a little football team that plays there. That's something that cannot be replicated in the state of Wisconsin. As you pointed out, the Tundra Lodge, which is just down the street from Lambeau, um, resulted from the increased demand for water parks in the state of Wisconsin and the Midwest, just like golf courses. We have more golf courses than we have golfers. We're getting close to having more water parks than we have people who can play and swim in them. Um, those water parks that are situated in those communities that have all those other assets are the ones that are gonna survive. So when you look at Blue Harbor and you look at its location on the lake and you look at its location on the river and all these other assets that the city of Sheboygan has, long term, Blue Harbor will probably do well. All those assets that will allow Blue Harbor to do well are what will allow this master plan or more, more accurately, the development in this district to succeed and to thrive. So I can't say these are the three things that are going to make this work and prevent those other communities I mentioned, the other communities in the neighborhood from competing against you. But the city of Fond du Lac does not have this anywhere in the city, anywhere within the periphery. Um, Port Washington doesn't. Um, Ashwaubenon and certainly doesn't. They have a whole different set of assets. So I apologize for the fact that's kind of a long-winded long, long rambling response, but there's nothing quite it's just not a simple um, the, this, that, and the other that differentiates Sheboygan. There's just a variety of factors. What I will say is everything that I just articulated is articulated much more clearly and much more effectively in the plan itself. 
So we lay out all the market basis for this, the things that differentiate Sheboygan for other communities, the demographic differences, the existing businesses, the existing <coughs> land uses and such. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Jeff Sanders and Charles. Thank you very and Clark much. Clark Meyer, very much. Um, maybe we just would di uh, take a minute to discuss. We want to make a recommendation as Committee of the Whole as to this plan. Um, that's the next point of action. Any input from us um, or from City Planning, what you'd like us to say, if you want to, whether we approve, well, whether we agree with it or not, but if you have some suggestions of how you'd like this to be coming forward. Alder Person Montemayor. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Do we need to make a motion to move forward with a pot, with a favorable recommendation to the council? Well, uh, Steve mentioned a rec that they would like a recommendation from us. Um, I guess we can say we don't want to do it uh, as well, but um, then I will so move. So moved a recommendation to do what? To move forward with a resolution to present this to the council with a favorable uh, recommendation that the council approves accepting this master plan. Okay. I'll second. It's moved and seconded to accept this master plan as presented this evening. Yes. Okay. Um, and it's been seconded. Any discussion? I just would just comment. I think one of the things that I think is that. That's my question was, you know, what's the life of this plan? And, and your question to uh, Alderperson Montemayor. It's not that we're committing funds at this point. We're, we're not committing funds. I think it's a concern of some citizens that we might be committing funds to this uh, project when we are so strapped. But it is to accept the plan and concept. And also, no matter what plan we would ever accept in any area whatsoever at all, there will be some who will not like it. Right. Any other comment on that? Yes, uh, Steve Sokolowski. Just the only comment I would have is that, you know, if you take a look at the Harbor Center master plans and the solid pier plan and things like that, those have all been developed from the early 90s. We're doing the hubby of the project over at uh, the Kingsbury site, which was in the early 90s. So these plans, uh, there's not an expiration date or things like that. They are a guide and have been useful with many of the developments, the Grand State, uh, uh, the, the uh, Highland House, uh, South Pier, things like that. So they're, they're fluid, they're evolving, and so from our perspective, we think it's just a good idea and we're looking forward to with the Council of Rights Committee's Bowles recommendation. Uh, I think you alluded to it, Steve, so if we, did, if we recommended or accepted this plan, how would city development work with it? Would you have drawings and what would you do then with it? How would you work what, what with we, it? What our approach is, is when developers come into the city or anyone who's interested, we now have a plan, we have a document that shows development is uncertain. There's always risks in development. A developer likes to come in and not just uh, go through your city just aimlessly kind of looking for things. We can provide them documentation, whether it's this plan, whether it's the Harbor Center Master Plan, whether it's the South Pier Plan, and say, here are some I, I, I opportunities that have been identified by staff, by have been adopted by the Common Council, that show certainty to these developers that if they're looking in certain areas, that the risk in developing in those areas is less, and therefore more likely to see some type of development or redevelopment. So from our perspective, that's how I'm going to use it, and that's how our staff is going to use it, is as people come in, when they leave, instead of just talking, we can physically give them a document that they can refer to and, and take it back to whomever they need to discuss it further. And then, and just like many of the other things, the Highland House, the Grand State, utilize those documents and eventually come in with a development proposal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Paulette Enders. And if I could just mention as well that it's not only on the reactive side, but it's also proactive because this area definitely needs, you know, that's why we undertook this master planning process was a, a redevelopment plan as well as a development plan. So we'll be looking at the, um, the alternatives that um, will hopefully be adopted by the Common Council and then taking a 
uh, potentially a proactive approach which involves committees, redevelopment authority, common council. So, you know, it's, it's always, you know, we work as staff, like I said, in a, in a reactive way if someone comes in to us, but we also try to act, act proactively. But then if we are going to expend any type of funds or make decision, it always comes back to this group. Okay, um, before we vote on it, does Omni have any other role to play in this a part of the, do they, will they come back for chapter nine? Or do, is it, what is this, chapter nine is us? <laughs> this is actually, once adopted, if there aren't any modifications that need to be made, this is the end of their contract with the okay. city. Other than the delivery, other than yes. presenting the color final document. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Well then, I think uh, we have a resolution to adopt what we pre uh, was presented this evening as a plan uh, for the city de for the development of the Taylor Heights area, and they use it as a guide. And we have a second on that, so we'll take a roll call vote on this. I think um, I'm not sure about the, the rules, but um, would you say we need a roll call? I think a voice will be fine. We can do a roll. We can do a roll call. Okay, let's do a roll call. Then we know. Okay. Tucker. Aye. Heidemann. Aye. Kath. Kittleson? Aye. Clay Yunus? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Ren Fleischwitz? Aye. Surik? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Vu? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. 11 ayes. Thank you. It passes unanimously. Thanks very much, everybody. I just want to remind everyone before we adjourn that the next committee, the whole meeting will be August 4th. We've changed the date. August 4th would be the day after the Common Council meeting on August 3rd. And it will be at 5 o'clock instead of 5.30. And we will be dealing with the IT presentation, which the mayor requested. And immediately after that is the uh, national night out uh, for the city as well. So that's why we're doing it at 5 o'clock. OK, so um, adjourn. And move to adjourn. So Second. Second. Moved. OK, we're adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody, for coming out. And